lot of cool stuff. So uh, today we are going to be covering uh, some varieties of uh, theories about game writing. And um, I, I'm teaching this from a pretty uh, introductory level. I forget, forgive me if any of you are veteran game writers, because this is probably going to be a little basic for you. So just kind of like sneer at me a bit so I know who you are. Cool. All right. So first category, our first objective we're working on today is traditional versus game writing with a little bit of interactive dialogue, branching narrative. Uh, that is a huge topic that I would never be able to or work on in an hour and you wouldn't want me to because it would be ugly. We're going to talk about it a little bit. Uh, then we're going to talk about the mysterious USI triangle. And uh, beyond that, uh, the generic character dilemma. Uh, you'll get more details on that in a bit. And then finally, time depending, uh, QA. Plus, if you have any questions, there's my stuff. You can always hit me with questions later from on my email address or a card, let me know. All right, anyway, first off, that's right. I was so happy to find this. Let's give it a second. I believe you might know these gentlemen. So if I asked you to write lines for this comic, what information would you draw on? Yeah. Oh, so you know who the father is. Cool. OK, uh, what is this comic? Captain House. Right, exactly. So you know who the father character is. So you would draw that on that information, even though you don't have any text. Cool. Awesome. What else? Ooh, nice one. What else? Yeah. That that tire came from the father's car. Oh, that's cool. That is a very good. So you basically you're saying the observation of the scene. Yeah. Sweet. Okay. What else? The uh, speech bubbles. Oh, what about them? Well, the last one is very much uh, jagged and explanatory. That is very true. Well, what else can you tell me about those speech bubbles? They're just in every single panel. They're in every single panel. So it looks like you have four lines here. <coughs> and what else? There's a, set, not, there's a set space that you have to write. Bingo. So what's the metaphor here, guys? That's right. In most game writing, in fact, pretty much all game writing, you're going to have a character limit or a word limit. And that pretty much defines what you can say. Generally speaking, when you're, when you're doing, and what, what I'm saying is uh, basic game writing, you're brought in very late in the project. Uh, you are given a lot of scenarios that you have to write for, and you have temp dialogue that you replace with your own. And usually you have character limits. You have uh, an environment to study, characters to look at, and that's what you have to work with. So anybody want to take a stab at this? First, first, first bubble, what do you think he's saying? Are you done yet? Oh, okay, are you done yet? Cool. Second one? If you're <coughs> His line was, are you done yet? If you, if you want to do it, somebody else. It's kind of tricky to do on the fly, I get it. This is going to be so much fun. Cool. What else? Third line, they're swinging. <clears throat> um, something along the lines of, do you think your dad will miss this tire? OK. And fourth line? <laughs> Beautiful. All right, so congratulations on your game writing there, guys. You can add that to your resumes. <laughs> so, who here, let's get this off for now, who here uh, does any writing whatsoever? Poetry, no, our novels? Wow. That is awesome, guys. So, tell me, what are some of the challenges with writing? <laughs> Bingo, yeah, sure. Uh, creating a cohesive story. Oh, damn, yeah. 
Y'all start small, man. Master John. <laughs> what else? Unbelievable dialogue. Sure. Okay. Taking motivation throughout a very long story. <sighs> Ain't that the truth? Yep. What else? Uh, knowing what to keep and what to scratch. True. Editing. Every every writer's dream is editing. What else? Character motivation. Ooh. Okay. So more on the mechanics too. Yeah. Defining character. Okay. So the stuff before all that. Yeah. So, how much of this do you think applies also to game writing? <laughs> yeah, all of the above. <laughs> Very much so. So let's move on to then game writing. What are some additional demands and problems that you only get with game writing itself? Yeah. Integrating the story with the gameplay. Oh, sure. Yeah. That's, that's something we will cover in a bit. What else? Having to um, account for there might be choices that players will make. Very nice. Yeah. Can you, can you tell me more about that idea? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I can study. No, it's cool. Um, well, let's see. Um, well, you have to, for example, if you're going into like a dialogue scene, you have to take into account, like, okay, well, what dialogue will the player be likely to choose? In which case, there's usually like, like good, bad. Oh, so we're moving directly on to in our interactive dialogue, yeah, branching. Uh, that's entirely true. So, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, go on. Uh, cut down exposition. Oh, yeah, and deadlines, too, right? <laughs> There's a few deadlines, and once again, you're, most of the time, you're not lucky enough to be working on your own, developing your own game, you're working with a team. And it sounds like, from what I've been hearing from you guys, is you, you work at, on teams here, yeah? That's a really good practice, but it's still it's still tricky to start integrating your own style with the teams. Yeah, uh, maintaining subtlety or uh, foreshadowing. Oh yeah, well that that is tricky, especially in some of the games that you'll end up working on for sure. So I want, I want to go back to the point he made though. Uh, so the the role of a game writer at its very base is you are sort of an interpreter. This is too loud, by the way. No, I feel like I'm echoing a bit. Uh, you are an interpreter between what the intent of the designer is and what the player thinks when they're playing the game. So you are a bridge. And it's a magical and very dangerous thing to be. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. So, does every video game have a story? Nope. No. No. Yes. So, tell me about a game that doesn't have a story. Tetris. Tetris. Hmm. Okay, now think about it from the point of view of the player. What's going on in their head while they're moving those blocks around? Oh, holes are forming, managing holes, trying to figure out where they're going to put future pieces. Okay. So is it always logical, or is it at some point does it become intuitive? Tetris head and start playing it in your dreams. <laughs> so, a thing to remember is that even if you put absolutely zero story in a game, the player is still telling themselves a basic story no matter how basic it is. They're telling themselves a story that they're building rows after rows, they're building buildings, they start seeing skyscrapers. The player's brain is always working when they're playing these games. If I'm playing a sports game, for example, which I never do, but let's pretend I do, uh, you, you are character X, you are the football player. See how, how little I watch sports? And you you are going to, you have the ball, you are running, you are running, ah, oh, there's cheers going on around you, this is your moment, you're just a dude sitting in a living room playing, but you are gonna make it, you're gonna get a touchdown, and it's gonna be awesome. You feel the elation, you are telling yourself a story as a player there. So the the idea from, uh, for game writing is that you, hey, let's see you there, is that you never, quite ever ditch that feeling that you are telling a story as a player. Cool? Any questions so far? All right. So, when you, when you touched on this a little bit earlier, what if, what happens if the player's story, the one they're telling themselves while they're playing the game, hopping around, jumping from platforms, collecting coins, whatever the hell, contradicts the game story? That would be, wouldn't that be 
disheartening for a player, like if especially if the game tells them that what they're thinking is wrong. Very true. What else? It takes them out of the game. Ooh. Is that is that desirable from a design point of view? No. Uh, anyone been on Steam lately? <coughs> uh, one or two new games there per day? Ish? <laughs> Lots. So as a designer, your games have a lot of competition. And the moment the player remembers that they're playing a game, they also remember they got to do some dishes. They also remember they got to do some homework. They stop playing your damn game. So you want to avoid that. Now, there is a very uh, fancy and technical term that I never use, but I'm going to whip it out here at college. What's the term for when the gameplay disagrees with the story? Cool. Everybody hear that? Uh, say it again with Robert so yeah. You got it. And that, that is exactly that. It's a, the, the, what you're doing, okay, let's, let's do a better example. Who here played uh, Watch Dogs 2? <laughs> Nobody. Okay, this is, this is great. Uh, <laughs> okay, who here has ever played any open world game whatsoever? Okay, yeah, okay, great. All right. So, have you ever played one where the the main character wasn't an out-and-out -out murderer, but it was actually kind of a funny, likable guy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it happens, doesn't it? Now, if it's a Grand Theft Auto-style game, they're still driving over people and being generally reckless. So what kind of message does that send to the player who's seeing all this funny dialogue while they're running over people? I'm a sociopath, <laughs> at best. And so that is the feeling that you get. It's, Trust me, I love comedy in games, but that is a, pro a continuing problem with open world games. That's why they bully so much, because you couldn't murder anybody, but at the same time, you were kind of funny. And I, 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 still, I still hold that game up as one of the best open worlds. Side note. So, let's see. So once again, you have to make sure that the game story matches the player's story. That's pretty much the goal of game writing. You are an interpreter. Cool so far? Dig. Oh yeah, I was going to cover a branching dialogue. Okay, so can someone give me a, a example of a branching dialogue game? Mass Effect. Mass Effect is one, absolutely. Anyone else? Wolf Among Us. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That was a really good game. I played it twice. What else? Telltale Series. Telltale Series, yeah. Yeah. Oxenfree. Oh, yeah, it is, isn't it? It's very branchy. I love that game. Cool deal. So, what are some additional challenges of branching dialogue? And I think you touched on it earlier. You have to write, like, double the dialogue. Oh, more than double, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, let, let's imagine here... Word, 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 word. This is NPC dialogue, and I'll write N. Okay? So, NPC just said their line, and now we have player option number one, player option number two, down to player <laughs> option 237. <laughs> Obviously, this is not ideal. That would be a very large dialogue window screen. So, how do we limit the number of uh, player responses while also making sure that we encompass everything the player wants to say at that moment? Well, there's some evil magic here. Anyone want to take a stab at it? Making some of the responses vague so that they can fit multiple possible things that the player would want to express. That is a good option, yeah, absolutely. Um, what, if, what if you um, guide the player to saying a certain, or like, oh no, that's not right. Um, like convincing the player to say like, have certain options. Did everybody hear that? Everybody get it over there? Exactly. You manage what the player wants to ask by very carefully maintaining what the NPC says. You don't introduce exciting new things that the player wants to ask about. You manage your information very carefully. And that way, you manage the amount of responses you have to have. Now, there's an additional rule with interactive writing that also applies to regular. 
is that uh, you have a challenge a lot of the time in making very interesting NPCs, non-player characters. And so the temptation is always to give them the most badass line. Anyway, this is very dangerous because who should have the best lines ever? The player. Bingo. Now, you can give the NPC cool lines, but the player better be able to do something that's even cooler than that. And that, I mean, game writing is fluid as hell, but that's probably one of the, the top, like, golden and shrined and lead rules. <laughs> cool so far? Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, please. And what about in a game like Dragon Age Inquisition, where, like, the main character who you're playing is supposed to fit any personality, so their lines aren't that interesting, but then your companion characters are very interesting and have really cool lines that fit their personality? No, that's very awesome. Um, our, that's a very good question. So, basically, you still give the character a the cool lines. Uh, generally speaking, even though characters are generic, they have important roles. Uh, in, the, in Dragon Age Inquisition, you are the Inquisitor. And you can condemn people to death with a word. And you can, but you're, you're awfully vanilla when it comes down to it. But by God, you can say the coolest stuff and do the coolest things. Everyone looks to you. All the interesting companion characters look to you for the answers. And that takes some of the sting off of having these, these things be so generic. And, you know, in, in there's not a lot of games out there that do like high volume branching dialogue. So you often have to limit things a lot, but there's different variations by gender, there's different variations by the companions that are with you. There's all sorts of flexibility you can get into, and I'd love to talk more about it, but I, we probably don't have the time tonight. But I'd love to ask any more specific, or answer any more specific questions about interactive dialogue while we're here. Or we can do it later if you think of something. Cool. All right, so uh, have you guys read of Twine? Those of you who haven't, it's a free program online that you can get. It's a interactive software, interactive dialogue tool. And if you have an interest at all in writing interactive uh, dialogue and branching dialogue, I really recommend messing around with it yourself and getting a feel for it, because that will get you way more up to speed on how everything else is done. Play a lot of these, of these types of games, create these programs, or these conversations yourself, using Twine, see how it feels to you. It will become much more intuitive the more you do it. All right, so let's talk about this magical triangle. Man, your poor teachers have some porous borbs here. <laughs> there we go. So this triangle represents three things that every game line, or every line of dialogue must be. All right, the first one up here. Anybody want to take a stab at it? Engaging? With a U. Oh, oops. <laughs> Engaging. <laughs> you got it. That is such an exciting word to start off this triangle with, isn't it? But what does that mean, do you think? Yeah? The character, I mean, the character provides useful information to the player. Like what? Like, where, are you, where do we need to go for the next quest? Or what do we need to, like, to achieve certain goals or to get certain items? Mm -hmm. Or they might just give you some clues about what happened in this area, the story of the world. So, yeah. Wow. You covered like four of my points right off the bat. <laughs> no, no, please. I, thank you. Uh, but that, that's right. Useful means objectives. If, if, if a line doesn't tell the player what they're supposed to be doing right there, it better be an art game. Because if it's not telling the player imp important information, that line might not be as useful as you hope. It has to tell them about plot. What else? Develop characters or settings or political temperature. Or if other, that information, I'm sorry, go on. Or you know, other setting, story, plot-related details. 
Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put fluff in this category, but if this is a political thriller game and I need to know that the House of Mormont is about to charge and I'm going to die and fail the game unless I don't know that the House of Mormont is about to charge, then yeah, that is useful information. So in this first section, and I do mention first for a reason, this line, or this line that you write has to be very useful. Now, Who wants to take a stab at the second? You can probably barely see because it's below the board. S. Significant. That is very nice. Not, not quite what I'm looking for. I'm going to add a uh, letter to be a clue. Remember your Calvin and Hobbes thing. Indeed. So, uh, Torment, Tides of Numenera, uh, my last project. Uh, you're going to love this, I think. Uh, had a character limit per node, little square box, of 500. <coughs> that is roughly uh, a line of dialogue, some description text, and another line of dialogue. It is luxurious. It is lovely as a writer to be able to write 500 characters. I've never had that luck before. How many other games do you think have a 500 character limit? No. Uh, in fact, I think Diablo had, and I, it's been years, but I think it had 25 word limit. Yeah. But, I mean, think about that. Uh, uh, did anyone here know anything about Torment? If not, I'm not going to get offended. Or Bioware games. Okay, cool. So, for example, uh, what's, the, what's the different play style there, generally speaking? In interactive dialogue games, what are you doing most? talking a lot, reading a lot. You're sort of sitting back, you're relaxing, you're sipping tea, you're reading. And Diablo, what are you doing? Cool stuff. Oh, yeah, and what else are you doing? Looting things. Oh, does that great. And then what do you do after that? Click, 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 click. That's right, you click and you click and you kill and you kill, and oh my god, there's a dialogue box, get that out of here, and you kill and you kill. <laughs> and that's the thing, is that even as the writer, once you've written lines that you just think are the best, and, they, and you just love them forever, the third time you see them, when you're trying to test your own dialogue, you'll want that stuff out of there, too. <laughs> Guaranteed. It's usually a good sign that you need to cut that line down a bit, too. But uh, so, a line has to be short. Has to be as short as possible, depending on the thing. If your character limit is 35, or is, uh, I'm sorry, if your word limit is, is 35 and you're hitting 35 or 36 every time, that is a danger sign for you. You can, you can do shorter than that. And in fact, I think that really harsh restrictions make you a better writer. Do you know why? Restrictions make creativity. Can you explain that? If you have a really, really big canvas and you're told to use every color, you'll sit there and ponder forever. But if you have restrictions, you then think about what can I do with that. Cool. Yeah, go ahead. You're able to uh, grab the essence of what you wanted to say rather than just mm -hmm. continuously uh, uh, Using exposition for when it's not necessary. Even though we love exposition. <laughs> and I saw a hand over here. Yeah. It forces you to think of interesting ideas you wouldn't have thought of if you weren't forced to. And that's, that's actually one of the reasons I love working on teams, too, because you are absolutely forced to work with other people's ideas. It's awesome. So, yes, uh, as a writer, you work to discover your style. And you think you have a style. And then you hit a 35 word limit. And you go, I wonder what my style really is once I tear this part out and this part out, but I really need this word and this word over here, and I need that preposition because this whole sentence will fall apart. And then you start thinking about what's really important. So short doesn't sound like a whole lot of fun, but short is how you get exactly what you need to say on a page. Scream. You know what I mean. This one's a little kinder. You got it. Whew, that's a relief. Those other two were bummers. So, how do you make a line interesting? You pack them full of characters, what you do. 
Oh, but please, what else? You can maybe tailor a line to a specific character to have them say a generic thing in their own special way. Ooh, you're, you're a step ahead of the, of the lesson plan. Thank you very much. We're going to get there in a second. But yeah, okay, like that. What else? Exclamation marks. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, editors will kill you. <laughs> what else? But yes, sometimes. Sometimes. Although if you use tarot bangs, editors will kill you. <laughs> Any other ideas? Let's, talk, let's, let's bear down on this a bit and think about how a character can express himself in 35 words or less. Have an opinion about something that's not a popular opinion. Okay, so they, they have an interesting outlook on things you're saying. Yeah. Cool. What else? You could give them a unique way of speaking. Oh, okay, like what? You could give them an accent or have them not use any contractions and use a lot of biggish looking words. Okay, so it's so, sort of a stylistic thing. You, yeah. you build out their character through their choice of words, through their, their lack of contractions, which is a very valid point. Usually, that's usually a bad guy trick. <laughs> what else? Sometimes you can combine the dialogue with action. Like, like how? Like in Fire Emblem, during the little support conversations, they'll have like, Asterisk saying what the character is doing, but it's done. It's done pretty tastefully most of the time. Oh man, you don't. You don't have to worry. I, I use uh, prose and narrative all the time. <laughs> no sweat. But I, I think that sounds awesome. Anything else? Yeah. Maybe you have the character use one particular unusual synonym for a word. Like if the rest to, to of Say red, have the character say chartreuse. Or cool. I mean, it's all in service of the character. So if you're if you're establishing a character that says chartreuse, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So you you are are interesting is in service to the character and who they are. And sometimes you have thirty five words. Sometimes you have five hundred characters. Sometimes you have something in between. Sometimes you have less. Game writing is always an exciting adventure in finding out what you have to cut next. It's it's often very fun. So. We're going to take this triangle and apply it against an example. Let me get my keyboard out here again. So if some of you missed the adventures I was having with this earlier, apparently this is a uh, Windows keyboard with a Mac. And I already don't understand Macs at all, so it is uh, a little bit uh, tenuous. All right, so before we start this video, a uh, little bit of a story. Uh, so, on Diablo 3, one, one of my very first tasks was I had to do one of those events that pop up where it's like a tiny little, it's not even a quest, it's just something happens and you have to do something. And so it was a, or the, the task pretty much said, a guard asks you to do something. Demons attack. The guard says something again. Demons attack. And so, I, I kind of thought about it, and I was like, wow, this is easily the most boring writing assignment I've ever heard. And so I, was, I, I started thinking about, like, I don't want to write a boring thing. And who wants to write a boring, okay, hands up everybody who wants to write boring things. And so I figured I'd at least amuse myself. And so I thought about ways to turn the information and the events happening, because that's generally what happens. You can't, or you can't take the Calvin and Hobbes thing and flip out the, the panels unless you're the cartoonist, I guess, but not as the writer. And just like with game writing, if you're going to tell you know, everyone in charge of building the levels and putting the characters in place and doing the script, if they have to change something for your writing, it better be for a damn good reason. So generally speaking, the, the challenge for you is to make whatever that word bubble is interesting. So let's take a look at this and see if you can spot any of the triangular, triangular things I did to make this hilarious to me.
Yeah, I have no idea if this volume is going to work, actually. Anyone know? Okay, cool. Let's find out. <coughs> Allow. volume thing works, and if not, we'll have to act it out somehow. <laughs> oh, maybe there's a microphone. Drink break, guys. We're gonna grab yourself a drink. Go get one. We could just start casting. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Which is cute, except for, you know, when I want to excuse Yeah, sometimes she, sometimes she, sometimes she, but most of the time she's like, I'll try it. She's just like, oh Well, because she's seven months, so she's just sitting there. Suggestions are terrible. Wow. <laughs> I'm literally interested in none of these. But all of these look so fun. Really? Is that what you said? No one ever. Okay. Day. Movie. Balancing the budget. Balance. 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 Balance.
Oh, it's in there. Huh? Oh, it's in there. 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 Oh, it's in I'm glad I wrote this down. Yeah. Don't worry, man. Yeah. I'll miss you. I'll miss you. Um, Tina. What? No, we'll do the hacking way. I swear to God, the moment I was going to open it. Man, that was quite an explosion. Oh my god, man. Oh, literally. Oh, literally. Yep, how, that was real big. Yeah, Thanks, Derek. As much as they like to do it. I spin it out for it. Well, I solved your problem. Why are you still doing this? It sounds like a Yeah, I would love to have this. I'm not going to guarantee All right, guys, we're about. Uh, a minute away. as interesting because it was like stabbing and people shouting and stuff. <clears throat> you can still see the dialogue. Oh yeah, by all means. Who wants to read the lines? <laughs> we have any volunteers for the part of Captain Hale? Yeah? I'll do it. Cool. Uh, get over close so you can see it. Actually, this is going to be much more fun. Uh, who wants to play uh, the part of Frightened Soldier number one? <laughs> oh my god, you were. Okay, rock, paper, scissors. I'll do it. You don't do the yeah. Okay, cool. Frightened Soldier. All right, I'm going to make this Sorry. bigger. Sorry, Derek. Sorry, Derek. You meant to just look at right? I love attending BO sessions, and this is the next best thing. So thank you. <laughs> All right. I think I've played this game a lot of times. I think, I think, yeah, we all have. It's rough. All right. So you walk up to Captain Hale here, and then... Thank the heavens you are here. We're down to four lads until reinforcements arrive. Cool. Waiting. <laughs> Fine. Trouble is, the lift <coughs> stopped. We can't see what went wrong through all the muck down there. <laughs> Explosion. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> oh. Okay, guard of the keep. Can you see that line? He, he's a minor character, so he's even get a speech bubble. Um, hey, guard of the keep. Okay. Yep, that's you. <laughs> More of the roots from below. Oh, more of the roots from below, Captain. What do we do? And he says, <laughs> Private, if you need to be told which end of the sword goes where, you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what do we know about the, about Captain Hale so far? Straight to the point. Yeah. What other words is he using here? He's kind of sassy. No. He is a bit sassy. He's a longtime military guy, I decided halfway through writing this. <laughs> what else? Maybe I should rewind it a bit so you can see. Um, he doesn't sound very personable to his, his, uh, his group, rather than referring to him by name. 
Oh, yeah, that's good. Let's scoot back a bit. What's that line tell you? He's desperate for getting there. He is desperate there, yeah. What, what, what terminology does he use? Ah, so what do we know about him right now? Yeah. <coughs> That's right. Thank the heavens you're here. We're down to four. That's interesting. And in fact, if you play through the rest of his lines throughout the game, he always refers to his soldiers as lads. And in fact, in this game, I don't think you had any female soldiers, so he wasn't being a dick about it. He just was, that was all lads. So uh, we got word choice. We got some sassiness. A little bit of humor. These are all things that make, well, I hope, this scene more than just a generic conversation. So it's one thing for me to say that. I want to give you guys a chance to work on this too. So here's what we are going to do. Let's see what we got here. Two, two, uh, you two right there. You two, you two, you two, you two. Oh my goodness, you're back there by yourself. Can you work with him? Yeah, okay, cool. You two. You two right here. Two, 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 ah, uh, three. Sorry about that. You're the lucky group. So you guys can scoot a little bit closer to your partners because we have a short little exercise to do. And uh, by the way, that, that is my family back there. They're nice enough to join me here. Uh, do you girls want to be in your own group? Yes, okay. I do. Okay. Yeah. Just awesome. So here's the idea. Uh, I need because we're gonna we're gonna do a little improv here. Uh, we I'm gonna need a genre of game. Horror. Horror. Oh. <laughs> right off the bat. Fantastic. And I'm gonna need a location. I kind of want to play this game already. Yeah. Okay, so uh, give me who's the player character? <laughs> and I need a non-player character. A janitor. A janitor. Very interesting. We said this in Golden Gate Park. I think gen generically, go or San Francisco might be the best because I don't even know that much about the joint. So, <laughs> I think it's more likely where a janitor might be and a homeless person. Tenderloin. Depends. Tenderloin. Oh, okay, let's, let's, let's hold off on that idea for now. So, so in, in game writing uh, across the board, you're going to get a lot of tasks that sound boring, that sound sometimes nonsensical, that are going to be difficult to do and you don't have much time to do it. But it is your job to always make them interesting and useful and short. No scene should feel generic. So what we have a situation here, it's a horror game, so I'm going to wing this a bit. Um, a terrible, terrible poisonous fog has descended over San Francisco. It's turning uh, people into terrible things. Probably not zombies because they're overdone. Um, <laughs> Your character is a homeless person. 
they want to enter an area, and the NPC is blocking the only available entrance to that area and saying, you can't go in here, you have, or it's, there's poisonous fog past this point. Now, what, the, what the, character, the player character needs is a special gas mask. And so, first line should basically ex express the idea, you can't come in here yet. Doesn't have to mention the gas mask. That's up to you. Once they have the gas mask, second line, hey, go ahead and go on in. So, you can't come in, come on in. That's your mission. Okay, so, a few guidelines. I, of course, want you to name the NPC. Very important. Uh, keep Whatever you, words you choose, keep the NPC in character. You can only add words. Don't change the scenario in any way. And you have... 25 words or less. Per line or per line? 25 words per line, 25 words per line. Okay. All right, you guys will have five minutes to come up with this, and then we'll go over some of your answers after. Go. If you really are in love with songs, <laughs> From, that's pretty much in the course of the game. Player gets a gas mask from somewhere. It's part of the critical path. They got it somewhere else, and then they go, "Hey, I have a gas mask now." <laughs> One minute left, guys. Yeah. 
Probably a janitor looking character, so that's going to back up the plan. Cool. Yeah, oh, what was his name? Or her name? Oh, we didn't name him. Oh, Horace. What's that? Horace. Horace. Good janitor <laughs> name. Alright, who's that one? Go for it. So, our, our janitor's name is Jason. So, when you got stopped, he, uh, he would say, You usually don't care about your homeless folks, but I don't want another po poison dead body in this place either, leave this place. And if you get a, ma a gas mask, he'll say, How the hell did you get? Fine, whatever. Enjoy your gas for your metro for your shelter. <laughs> so cool, we have a sort of a callous uh, jackass in there. Cool. What else, guys? Go for it. This is Shane, Mr. Janitor. Um, oh, you want to be one of the cutesy ones, do you? <laughs> Step right in and take a big whiff with the green smoke. And then he picks up the gas mask. Oh, you're a smart one, I see. You're using the noggin. Be safe in there. Oh, <laughs> that sounds charming. Awesome. <laughs> so, uh, what, one second, my girl, one second. And then I'm here next. Uh, so with, with uh, accents, real quick, you want to uh, you want to be careful about how you do that, because too much, unless you're in a game that's full of them, can be overwhelming. So uh, tendency is to drop Gs, add apostrophes, and get you a long way. But always choose like one thing and do it consistently rather than a bunch of stuff to make it look authentic. Go for it, kiddo. Right away, I'm in the cafe of the best side of the big It's an absolute nightmare back there. Turn back away. You're not going to scare me. I'm going to scare you. You can go in. This is Toya. You can go in, but watch yourself. And here, take this gas mask. That's awesome. Thank yeah. you. Cool. Who else? I can't follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Be brave. Be brave. <laughs> Anyone else want to share their adventures? We have Johan the Janitor. That's a very brave name. <laughs> Sorry, I can't let you in. There's a gas leak, and I can't let anyone else die. I lose another job. <laughs> and if he returns, you're hell bent on going in there, huh? Well, it's not my job to stop you. Just watch the floor. It's wet. <laughs> That's nice. Plus the poison gas and all. Yeah. 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 Just that. Awesome. Does anyone else want to go? Sure. Yeah, please. So, Janitor Gordy, um, he says, Holy carp, there's poison gas. Stranger. Holy, holy carp? Was holy that? carp, yes. Awesome. The fish. Please go on. Stranger, if you go in like that, it'll kill you dead. Cool. And you come back with a gas mask and he says, Oh, you found a gas mask. Should be good to go now. Good luck, stranger. Beautiful. What else, guys? I'm, I'm really liking how I'm hearing a lot of character cohesiveness in here. It, it really lends a lot of life to your characters, even for simple scenes like this. We didn't get that far, but I can tell you. Sure, go I, for it. I actually wrote that level for sitting for this. So, uh, the, uh, Janitor is more like, ever inhaled chlorine gas? I haven't tried, neither should you. When the uh, homeless guy is Rick. <laughs> well, it's not like I have much to live for, but I've been pretty lucky surviving this mess so far. Morty replies, 
Well, if, if you want to try your luck without dying, I have an expired gas mask you're welcome to the Russian roulette with. <laughs> wow, that doesn't does sound risky. Reminds me of, what, what's the game? The Metro, oh, it's called Metro. <laughs> yeah, we have the, the horrible gas mask that could crack and everything. Mm -hmm. Awesome, all right, anybody else? Cool. That was some good work, guys. Give yourself a round of applause. All right, so we've pretty much reached the end of my content. Uh, we can have some time here for Q&A &A if you guys have any questions for me. It doesn't have to be about this material. It can be about stuff I've worked on with the Reason NDAs, blah, blah, blah. Anything you want to ask me? Yeah? If you were um, hiring a game writer, what would you be looking for in their application and their interview? Good question. Uh, it, first of all, it would really depend on the project I was working on. Um, for example, like an action RPG, I'd be looking for someone who could write very succinct dialogue, someone who could you know, get the idea across in 35 words or less. Uh, for the games I'm, look, I'm working on now with Branching Narrative, it's a design, our design background, so they understand you know, how, our, what makes an interesting quest, what makes an interesting character. And experience with Branching Narrative, now that is a really tall order. And, <laughs> We're, we're kind of we're kind of grappling with that right now because we're trying to find someone who has pretty much experience writing a game that only the people in that room have worked on. You see what I'm saying? So it can be tricky. So that's why I say uh, definitely if you uh, want to work as a game writer, try a bunch of different mediums. For one thing, and uh, second of all, I, I'm seeing some networking buddies in here. Uh, if you uh, are not networking and you want to be in, in the game, uh, the games industry, you got to network, like all the time. Like, uh, uh, who here goes to Beer Wednesday? I'm shop that. What's that? Oh, awesome. Uh, who here does that? Has no idea what I'm talking about. It's totally fine if you don't. Okay, so every week uh, since the dawn of time, uh, <laughs> there's been Beer Wednesday in Tustin. You don't have to drink beer. I certainly don't. Uh, but it's at uh, the old Dubliner, A U A O M right there. A-U-L-D. Oh, totally. But uh, I'm, I'm going to make it a visual thing so everyone can Google it. That's a dead motion. Where did I put my marker? There's another one And I know that the word networking fills everyone who doesn't network with drear, or fe, f, fred and drear, with fear and dread, uh, or disgust because the word networking is evil, and it is. Uh, but what um, Beer Wednesday is at the Old Dubliner, it's in, er, in Tustin, it's every Wednesday at night, and it's game developers and game industry people and people who like games come together to basically yell at each other and drink in a friendly way. And the more you are introduce yourself to people, and the more you talk to them, the more you'll hear about things that are coming up in the industry, the more you'll hear secret information that they're not supposed to be talking about, oh my god. Uh, you'll hear all sorts of interesting info, and they'll get to know you. And in a very competitive industry like the games industry, you need every foothold you can get. I've gotten more jobs through networking and through LinkedIn tomfoolery than by dissent. In fact, I don't think I've ever gotten a job in the industry uh, by sending in a resume and cold calling, except for customer service at Blizzard. Woo! And that was it. Yeah. No, I'm just solidarity. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so does that answer your question, or do you need more info? Because I'm happy to go on about this all night. So like, what kind of stuff would you put in a portfolio if you were applying for a writing job? Uh, well, it's a good question. Uh, same, same thing that a, like if, if I was an artist and I was applying for a certain place, I would make sure that these, the samples I provided matched the style of that house. Same with writing. Uh, if I'm going to give something to a, if I'm applying for Diablo 4, for example, I could send them, you know, branching stuff, but they're going to go, wow, this guy is way too wordy and full of himself. We need quick, snappy dialogue. So I'd probably want to focus more on stuff like that. Uh, if you, or you, I mean, if you don't have uh, a, a, a title behind you, if you haven't published a game before, don't have your name on and the credits, 
then you could give them uh, fiction. You can work on Twine because Twine does exports, and you can show them stuff like that. Uh, you work on your own games. You can give or show them that. And honestly, if you are a writer, uh, I strongly recommend that you at least dip your feet in designs. <coughs> now, that's not to say that that'll always help you, because from what I hear, uh, uh, Bioware doesn't let its writers touch design, which is crazy to me. And uh, Guerrilla was definitely the same way the Horizon Zero Dawn guys. They basically they, we are we were going to be writing dialogue, and that was it. No conditionals, no adding in, like changing variables, none of that stuff. I love that stuff, and so I recommend you try too because it's fun and it's like fitting puzzle pieces together. Does that, does that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions? Can you relate a good learning lesson from either when you had maybe a difficult assignment or something that taught you something, or you learned a certain sure truth about about writing something something? Yeah, I will have a few. Uh, I'd say that one particular thing to look for is uh, don't under underestimate the power of a good team. Uh, you alone are creative and, mar are and marvelous and wonderful and you have ideas that no one will ever have. You with a team makes you twist those ideas and change them into something. Be open and ready to change your mind. And tied to that very closely is pick your battles. Uh, if you love a character the way they are and someone else doesn't love it, think about why you're so resistant to changing that. Think about think what will break if you change that character. And maybe that character can change. And the more that you are willing to flex to somebody else's idea and change your idea for the team, the more you'll grow as an artist. But if that character can't change without breaking a whole ton of stuff, that's probably a good time to make your stand. And if you make your stand when you usually don't, people will go, oh, I guess he's a little nervous. Cool. Anything else? Yeah? What's your favorite game in terms of writing and why? Oh, dear. Um, do I have to pick a, uh, like a particular genre? <coughs> I'm terrible at this one. Uh, RPG? So, well, OK. Uh, my my first game that I ever said was my favorite was uh, System Shock 2. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, not really an RPG. Just who's here played System Shock 2? Okay, who's here has played Bioshock? It's basically the same sort of generic feel with scarier sound design and an omnipotent uh, artificial intelligence who wants to kill you. It's fantastic because the, every part of the writing I, I, tells you how alone you are and how what a desperate situation you're in. And I, I think it can't be matched for environments still. Uh, for general writing, God. I'm going to stick to System Shock 2 for now because I can't really remember. I've played so many great games. Oh, you, if you want to try a cool uh, art game, I'm going to have to tell you about it later except for the name of it. But no, I'll look it up. I have it in my notes. But uh, there's a Flash game uh, written by Gregory Weir. Have you ever heard that name before? Yeah, he's an amazing guy. I think it's called The Day. Is, it, is someone on the internet right now? Can you look that up while I'm blabbering? The Day, Gregory. Uh, and if, if you want to see a game with great writing and great design around it, by all means, check that out. I, 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 I still use that in classes, and I love it. Yeah, it's The Day. There's okay. a side of Newgrounds. Yeah. Yeah, uh, check out that game. I, I, I love indie games. But check out that game. Uh, see what it tells you to do, and see what you're allowed to do as a player making your own story. And you'll see why I love it so much as a writer. Cool. Uh, what do you consider one of the most important lessons from game design that you use in game writing? Hmm. Uh, like, in, say, for example, in uh, Torment or in... Just in general, or just any lesson from game design you use a lot when you're writing. Sure. Uh, don't be afraid to look like a dumbass. <laughs> Ask lots of questions. If you have uh, worries about something, talk to someone about it. Uh, definitely reach outside of your comfort zone whenever you can. Uh, say yes as many times as possible. If someone wants you to do, do like a, a design document for the first time, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that kind of responsibility. Just try it. 
be willing to branch out because the more you flex yourself, the more you're, you're going to learn. And you are going to screw up, and it's going to be embarrassing, but you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, for somebody that doesn't have experience in terms of making a portfolio, would I create mock ups, things like that, or would I try to just wait until I've been on the project and have something to show? Uh, I, I think that they're both great options. I mean, the more, the more you network, the more you'll uh, find people who are willing to give you chances at things. The more you'll uh, run into people who will say, hey, I know that one person who's you know, interested in writing, and this is an entry-level position, so I'll tell my boss that this person is looking for a job. So uh, don't worry so much about not having a particular thing to put in it. Uh, if you want to get writing samples, uh, Twine's a great way. You can also work in, uh, I, th I think if you're uh, applying for various companies that have tools on the outside, like BioWare, you can work with their tool set and come up with scenarios. Um, honestly, uh, if, if somebody sent me uh, their short stories, I'd be looking at it for a dialogue, sk or a dialogue skill and a description. I just see how they, how they phrase <coughs> things. That doesn't show me how well how they can design, but I mean, there's ways for us to test how someone can do that too. Like, uh, when, I was, uh, trying, <laughs> when I was trying out for Torment, I was in Europe still. And uh, they had me do a test using the uh, Obsidian editor, the text editor. So I had to download everything from there uh, into the Netherlands, set it up, tech support with the people, write the conversation, send it back. And so if they, if they want to talk to you, they will find a way. And that is one of the more complex ways I've ever taken a test, but it was very accurate. Any other questions? Sure. Any book on game writing or game design that you would recommend? Not necessarily, and that's not to say that they're not good. Uh, I, I haven't read a lot of those because I kind of work through the industry in a very strange way. Uh, I strongly recommend for all writers to read uh, On Writing by Stephen King. I'd say that that's probably the one book that switched my view of writing style around. A lot of people go for Strunk and White. I'm Stephen King. Oh yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Who's your favorite writer? Oh, my favorite writer. Uh, uh, I probably, if I if I had to pick one, do I have to pick one? Okay, uh, Joseph Heller, <coughs> Catch Twenty Two, uh, Terry Pratchett, pretty much everything <laughs> after the tenth book. Um, Douglas Adams. Uh, you see, you see, I'm going in a direction. <laughs> uh, so yeah, definitely, I, I favor uh, things that are funny but also tragic. Stupid new behaviors to avoid, or you know, things that people commonly make mistakes on early on when they're trying to write, and they're they're you know almost trying too hard, or maybe they're just trying to cram all the lessons they're learning, but making obvious mistakes. Well, I mean, one of the most obvious mistakes, and I, I personally disagree with this a bunch because everybody makes mistakes. But uh, typos. If you're sending in samples with typos, there are some people who will toss it out the door. I've, I've made several typos in the course of my life, one or two, and uh, it, they happen. But definitely, uh, not everyone is going to be forgiving when they see typos in a writing submission, so watch out for that. Uh, generally speaking, if someone's new to the industry, they tend to do a lot of apologizing. Like, I'm just a student, I'm just a beginner, I'm just a QA person, don't do that. Yeah. Everyone here is, or everyone in the industry is pretty much just like you. They, they came to it through different routes, but uh, you don't need to explain yourself. You're, if, you, if you want to be in the industry, you're in it because you absolutely love video games and hopefully not for the money because unless you're a, like a lead producer, you're not making much. So treat everyone else uh, you know, like someone you'd like to get to know and don't apologize for being who you are. Yeah. This is for, I guess, Torment. How do you guys uh, prevent, I guess, more front loading? Because it's its own universe, I guess. So, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of problems that we had, I guess, were like, front loading more. And stuff. Well, I should probably explain this. So, uh, uh, hands up everyone who's familiar with Torment, uh, the new one. 
Excellent. So we have a brand new crowd. Uh, so uh, who here is a, a boyer of Planescape Torment? Same, same people. Okay, well, this is going to be a dangerous launch for us, I see. So, uh, Planescape Torment was an RPG that came out in about, I think it was like 1999 or so. Yeah, it was a text-heavy RPG. It was based around dialogue, interactive dialogue. You, you could avoid a lot of fights. You could talk your way out of situations. Even some of the last bosses, you could talk, them, or talk your way out of it. And it was a philosophical game that was based around the idea, what was the question, guys? What does one life matter? Very heavy stuff for a video game, but it was very popular. So flash forward to about four years ago, there was a Kickstarter, and they said, we're going to make a spiritual successor to Planescape Torment. We're going to call it Torment Tides of Numenera, which is a very long name, but it gets easier the more you say it. And that, it, the Kickstarter succeeded, and uh, flash forward to now, we're pretty much 1.3 million words. Yeah, that's a lot of words. Uh, and a lot of that is uh, branching, a lot of that is reactivity, meaning that the world changes according to what you do, and a lot of that is polish. Like we've cut things down, we've boosted them up in other places, we've moved conversations around. This is basically a game, and I sound a little pitchy here, but I just got back from Europe and I've been doing this for about a week. Uh, <laughs> this is a game that reacts to what you do. And so, this game is set a billion years in the future which is a really long time. Eight, eight civilizations have risen and fallen. This is the ninth world, and you are trying to find your way through it, and there's all this weird stuff around you called the Numenera. Uh, this is a, anyone familiar with the Monty Cook Numenera universe? Same people, awesome. So Numenera is the, the name for these strange artifacts that lie around, and in the past world, it might have been a starship engine, but the savages of the ninth world use it as a hat. That shoots lasers occasionally, and that's Numenera. You pick something up, you poke it, and probably it's going to kill you at some point. So his question, getting back to it, was about front-loading lore. And the question is, or the answer is, you do it really damn carefully. Uh, the, uh, Tyranny has a very ingenious system of, uh, it basically highlights words, and it makes it optional. So you can click on the word, and it'll say, ah, the veil of whatever, the veil of sorrow, there was this great witch king, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I can go, wow, that was really interesting. Close and move on with my game. We didn't have that tech in Torment. And so we essentially have to very carefully gate that. So what we'd end up doing, everyone got Old Dubliner who wants Old Dubliner? Yeah? Okay. If not, you can ask me again, no worries. Goodbye, janitor. Goodbye, San Francisco. <laughs> All right, so basically speaking, and you saw this before, oh dear. I want us to destroy this pen. We would have, and this is incredibly simplistic because usually you had like down, down, down. But let's just say we had this NPC line here that came from somewhere else. And since this is Torment with 500 characters per node, we always went for two. So NPC, NPC starts off their business here, clarifies here, and then we would have the options. And a lot of these were conditionalized based on previous responses, so you wouldn't always see all the player responses. Like, I think in the larger conversations, which were around uh, 200 of those, in massive branches, uh, you would have uh, many, many options per node. And in fact, hang on, if I want to be really technical about this, we would have an intro node that would link to here. See how fast this gets complicated? So anyway, um, we would have these, these nodes here. And these would be the player lines. Now what you would do right here, as I said before, is you'd manage very carefully the information that you covered in here. Usually, if it was tied to a quest, it would be the information you needed for a quest. And then you would get to the player options. Now, what we did is we'd look very carefully at the NPC nodes and we'd say, okay, which questions does the player want to ask? And more importantly, which ones do we want to make option? Now, in this particular case, these ones right here would probably be optional. And they would lead to NPC node here and then back to over there. 
Now, generally speaking, if we were feeling really feisty that day, we would have that unlock a conditional right here that would open up another one over here. Except up top. But generally speaking, only two of these would be required. So as a player in Torment, uh, you would be able to say, okay, the top ones are optional. I don't really care to hear about the Numenera again. I'm going to just move on with this conversation. And so you sort of get, we, we teach sort of the language to the player that top means optional or is new information, bottom means carry on. Uh, how did Mass Effect do this? Do you guys remember? Yeah. Go for it. Paragon, yeah. Renegade, right. folding arms neutral. Yeah. yeah, I have no I have no opinions about the salvation of the universe. <laughs> cool. Does that answer your question? Probably a little more detailed than anyone else wanted, but uh, I do I do love getting into that junk. What else? Uh, do you know of any software or resources you can learn this kind of node formatting? Uh, definitely Twine. Twine is uh, very simple but and sometimes a little clunky, although it's probably gotten way better since I've messed with it. But definitely check it out. I've used Twine. Um, really? I've also seen like spreadsheets where where professional projects, like they put dialogue in spreadsheets. Do you hmm. know where I can learn that? Or uh, a specific type of format? You know, I, I've heard of companies that use spreadsheets, and I've, I've done that in Word documents. Uh, frankly, I do prefer uh, Twine. What's your concern with it? Oh, just wondering, like, if there's a certain way that game writers usually write dialogue, then I should learn it. Oh, no, totally. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, Twine is a great way to get started. I don't think there's any free versions. Does anyone else know any that I'm totally missing? Inkle. Inkle. Inkle is a free one that you could download that plugs into Unity, and then there's a free online version that does the same thing almost as Twine. Except Twine, you can set the different routes and stuff. Inkle okay. is more like straightforward and so. uh, stuff. Uh, how do you spell it, first of all? So she can... uh, uh, I N K L E. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I know nothing about it, but. I, I, think I just found out about it a couple months ago. That's awesome. I gotta check that out. Now, does it allow for moving of moving nodes around? or? Um, <coughs> it's more like. Uh, no nodes, not like a map. It's more like uh, as you put in different uh, options, the options open up in different drop downs, mm -hmm. and then as you go through the drop downs, it kind of makes a map. But the map isn't like as stretchy as Twine. Gotcha. That sounds really cool. It's pretty. It's actually it functions a bit better because I I did projects in Twine and then Twine <coughs> worked, worked on me and I couldn't actually. Use that. So I'm like great. <laughs> so. uh, that sounds really cool. Any other free versions that you guys might have heard of to check out? These, these, these games are so rare that all, the tools are almost always re uh, proprietary. I, I know that uh, the original Planescape Torment team like wrote stuff into a Word document and had it sh like shuttled into the game from a distance. There's RenPy, which is a little different. It's visual novel oriented, hmm. but it's still branching text. That sounds cool. Which one? RenPy. No dot, it's just R E N P Y. Okay. Apostrophe in the middle. Ren. Oh, there's an apostrophe? Yeah. Because yeah. okay. Ren I and then Python. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, by all means, guys, check this out. The more experience you get with different tools, the more ways you have to give samples. <coughs> uh, I saw a question over here earlier. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just going to ask you if you had played uh, Fallout 4. No oh. Reason, if you had any opinions on the narrative and the <laughs> Oh, sure, yeah. I mean, I, I, I love uh, that feeling you get in Bethesda games where you step out of the opening thing, and they, they always have the best vistas, right? Like this, like, thing over here to explore, and there's a half-buried ruin to explore. And I mean, that is awesome. I think they, the reason why I'm glad I'm, I'm back in isometric uh, and not doing Fallout-style games right now is because it's, I'm sure a lot of the writers on that project would love to write more. They would love to write more. I mean, writers like to write more. But it's the same problem as, as you know, writing for any action RPG. Players aren't really there for the story. And you, players often say they are there for the story, but that's not the format for it. Like, you, you could fill that screen with words, but what's behind the words? Half-buried ruin. Mutant sewer. 
all this stuff that's drawing my attention away from the, the handcrafted words to the adventure I could be having right now while I'm reading these damn words. So it's a, like I said, I, I played through it. I want to play through it again, actually. Um, but the, it's, not, it's not a game for in-depth writing. Nothing else? Sure. How do I have long, luxurious hair like you? <laughs> uh, you, you just, uh, just take off your hat and concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if you have anything else, uh, I'll, I'll write down my email address too if you have any questions. Um, and feel free to send me questions later on. Uh, otherwise, Oh yeah, sorry. I heard my name. I thought someone was whispering a question to me. <laughs> Gavin at Fury .me. I'd be happy to answer questions. And other than that, thank you very much for your time. Have a great night. <laughs>